Hi, uh, I'm Noelle Stendrud and we're back again today with the, some esteemed graduates from Taylor's Falls High School or uh, Connections with Taylor's Falls and they're going to bring the Taylor's Falls High School alive for us today. So, I'm Joe Tim. I started uh, teaching there, not my first job, but I started teaching there uh, in 1980 and have been connected there through uh, being principal, a teacher, coach, activities director, when we combined um, in 92, 93 as one district. Uh, so for, uh, yeah, for quite a while, almost, uh, almost 30, 38 years. My name is Deb Jula Kine. I now teach fourth grade uh, at Taylor's Falls Elementary, formerly <coughs> Taylor's Falls High, uh, Independent School District. And I like to tell, when people ask me how long I've been teaching, I just say, well, I've been at Taylor's Falls since 1960. <laughs> but I graduated, I went to school there for 12 years, there was no kindergarten, and I graduated in 1973, and lucky enough to come back 22 years ago, and now I've been working at the school. I love it. Uh, Jerry Vitalis, and um, I went to school my, all my 12 years. Again, no kindergarten. Uh, I started school in 1942 and uh, was in uh, that school, um, elementary and high school, until 1952, uh, Christmas vacation, when we moved to the present school. And I graduated in 1954. My name is Dwayne Olson, graduated from Taylor's Falls in 1958. After uh, high school college, I became a teacher coach, and now I am also president of the Taylor's Ball School Foundation. Do any of you have any memories of the country schools? My, uh, my dad graduated from eighth grade from the Clover Blossom County School, and that currently is at the Elmerland Threshing Show. So. I go in there once a year and reminisce at my dad's pictures there, so that's my connection with oh. the county school. Very nice. My brother and sister went to Pleasant Valley School, which is about two miles from our farm, and um, the teacher uh, from Pleasant Valley was a one-room school, uh, and uh, all grades, and she uh, rented a room out of the farm next door. Well, I can remember more than once my, my brother saying, because of a heavy snowstorm or because of bitter cold, they never told anybody that there wasn't gonna be school. So they had to walk two miles and find out that the school wasn't even open, so. Uh, tell us if you have any memorable experiences from your high school. Well, let me start because I didn't go to high school there. I was a teacher and a coach, and uh, it was uh, probably there were two two things that I really remember the most. One was uh, one was the the we had one home football game that was always held at the school. Uh, the other ones were over at uh, Saint Croix Falls because they had the lights, so they would have uh, you know all the games over there. But we always hosted one in the, in the afternoon. Uh, usually we tried to start it by three o'clock. The team that we played, they'd come in early. Uh, it was kind of a, a nice situation because usually we had our uh, parent group, our booster club, which we didn't have individual like the Taylor's Falls boosters for the elementary or for the high school, the middle school. We had the Taylor's Falls booster club for the whole school. So whatever activity was going on, they would take part in it. And what was very nice about it is that they would actually host the football team, the cheerleaders from the other school, the coaches, and even some of the fans, they would always have something for them uh, after the game. And uh, we play in the afternoon. And I remember uh, some of the farmers who had boys that played it, and there also were cheerleaders that uh, their fathers were farmers too. They would bring their hay wagons and they would bring them in with their tractors. And that's what people would sit on to watch the game because you'd want to be a little bit above because if you sat behind the benches, you wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, we, uh, we, we did that every year that, that we had football. And that was starting, I mean, we had football way back, but then when I started coaching there in 80, all the way up and through uh, the time when we, we didn't have football, I mean, we always had one game we would host there. 
but uh, it, was, it was very nice. The other memory I had was homecoming was always during the winter. And homecoming was a huge celebration. It was a whole week. We always had a lot of alumni come back and it would all, it would, uh, it would all come together on uh, Friday night with the homecoming game, a boy-girl basketball doubleheader. And the other thing that we had was the dance on Saturday, which was always in the gym. Homecoming was always in the gym, and not too many alumni came back. They might pop their head in the door, but you know those wild '80s music. You know some of the alumni didn't want to have to listen to that. But it was very nice because we we incorporated even the elementary kids were involved in homecoming, and I think that's a unique experience because they all had little things that they would do, whether it be making pictures, posters, and then. Uh, and during the years uh, of the 80s, we would basically poster the whole gym. Whatever team that we were playing, the whole gym would be uh, posters of, of the team we're playing and slogans, you know, uh, it, uh, it depended on who we played. But uh, it was very, uh, it, it, was, it was really a way to unite almost the whole community. And everybody showed up for the game. And we have the band would be playing, and some of the basketball players and cheerleaders would have to at halftime go up and play in the band, and then they come down to the locker room, you know, for the instructions going out for the second half. So it, it was a unique experience. And then the next morning, student council would decorate the gym and the dance that night. And uh, but it was it, it's that small town atmosphere, that small town kind of uh, feeling where everybody looked out for everybody else and everybody enjoyed that. Uh, during the winter because we were I think unique to the area all the rest of them had during the fall. Mm -hmm. Joe did, um, the, did in the 80s did they have a band or did they have a DJ? Uh, we, we actually had a band some of uh, I think the first couple I was student council mm -hmm. so we would sponsor that we had a we had a band I think the first two times and and what happens there is that sometimes the band plays what they want to play and so we decided after a couple of years of that, the student council made a decision, let's have a DJ where we can actually pick songs. And so they did, they solicited ideas from the student body and they would tell them what songs were their favorites and whatever. And some of them were older songs, some of them were newer songs. And uh, then the DJ was given that list ahead of time and he would come prepared. And then everybody was on the floor dancing. Whereas you have a band, plus you never had to give a break to the DJ <laughs> because he could just play the music. And if you had to use the restroom, he could be black and you know, back in plenty yeah, of time. Yeah. So, so Jerry reminded me of a story about a particular poster that went up for. Yeah, we uh, <laughs> we were playing one time uh, the Isle Indians, and uh, anyway, it was one of the end of the week where they all had decorated the gym, and we had contests between. It was like the ninth grade had one corner, the tenth grade had one, and so on all the way around. And these kids started usually on a Tuesday. They would go down with their advisors, they would make posters in their rooms. It was a way of really, like I said, getting everyone involved. Whether you played basketball or not, if you were in, in a room, in a class, you had the opportunity to work in side by side with people and, and make it a poster or come up with a slogan or whatever. And we'll get to the slogan. But what happened was uh, we had decorated the whole gym and we usually locked it to make sure that nobody would go in. We want everybody to see it when they walk in for the first game. So the coaches, I was the head boys of basketball coach and Don Thornton was the head girls coach. And we had left, gone home, you know, changed, put our uh, suits on or sport, sport jackets. Came back probably, I would say, maybe uh, 4.30 or so. Opened the gym up, turned the lights on, getting things ready. And Don had the first game, I had the second. So he was kind of getting his stuff ready because uh, his girls just started arriving pretty soon for the JV game. And I was kind of surveying you know, this beautiful gym with all the posters and slogans. I looked up in the corner and there was one that was not real appropriate. It, it had something to do with, and I'm not going to go into the, all the slogan on it, but it had something to do with uh, reservations and uh, not having, you know, Native Americans partake in the American dream. Uh, and I'm saying it very nicely. So I was shocked because <laughs> I thought we saw everything, but I remember that, oh, the seniors, they were a little late getting that last poster up, and uh, they, they kind of held it probably, didn't put it up right away. Well, Don had to get ready, and all of a sudden he goes, by the way, Joe, he said, uh, guess who just pulled up? And I said, uh, I hope it's either the superintendent or the officials. He said, no, he said, it's the opposing team. 
And uh, so I said, Don, we're going to do a, a little uh, shuffle here. Uh, lock the gym door. Take, take the two teams on a tour of our building, which will take them a whole three or four minutes because we didn't have all the additions that we have now. And so while he was doing that, I flagged down a custodian, found the longest ladder I could find, and we put it up there. And of course, the custodian wasn't a real tall person, so I was the one that had to go up because I could, he couldn't reach the bottom of the poster. And I grabbed the best that I could because I knew they weren't gonna be on that tour too long. And I pulled and it ripped in half. But that was fine because you could only read the first part of the words and you know, it was er, 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 you know, all the way down and they could not figure out. They had a beautiful picture of a Native American with the full headdress, which was very nice, except the other part wasn't the best and that was the one we tore off. <laughs> so we got it down, took care of it, and uh, they were, they didn't know anything about it, the opposing team. They just thought that, well, oh, something happened to the poster or whatever. And uh, as I was sitting in the stands, you know, the, the girls game was starting. And anyway, what happened was that the senior boys started to filter in. Now, these weren't my basketball players. These are some guys who just thought they were going to pull this over on us. And uh, they looked, and I could tell right away because they looked up at that empty space. And then they kind of sat up where they usually sit. Well, I walked up there and I said, oh, by the way, we will have our discussion on Monday morning. <laughs> I want to interrupt you a minute. Uh, Dwayne and I, I think he's got a, a button. Uh, things have changed a lot because we played just the Saga City Indians. And uh, on the button it said, scalp the Indians, and there's, we're tomahawking it, and the blood is dripping, so things have changed. Go on. And, That's a good thing. And that would have been mild. <laughs> it, it was bad, but that would have been mild compared to what was on the poster. But anyway, we took care of it. Nobody was, uh, and uh, when we're off camera, I'll tell you what the poster actually did. So. <laughs> okay, Jerry and, and uh, Dwayne. Memories uh, that stand out to you from high school. Well, I, I'll give you a couple of memories of the elementary school on, was it Cherry Hill? Is that what they call? Angel Hill was the old. We well, called it The Rock. The, the Rock. Well, I can remember about third or fourth grade, I had to stay after school a couple times because my English wasn't very good. It was more Scandinavian. And I couldn't pronounce the THs and the Ss. And so after a couple of sessions with the teacher, she kind of gave up. She said, well, because you're Scandinavian, I suppose that you know, you're, you're okay, you'll make it. And the other one I think Jerry can relate to because he just said the rock. Well, the school was built on a hillside and the playground was rock and there were boulders behind the school. Well, in recess, we had to figure out something to do. And so the boys and some of the girls would go over the hill and probably 50 yards from the school, we'd go down the bluff and play on the rocks. And well, one day the boys said, well, this is kind of boring. Let's, uh, let's do something else. And so there was a power line cable, support cable at about a 45 degree angle. And I said, let's, let's scale this. <laughs> this would be kind of fun. So Dwayne, why don't you try it? Well, I went up about 15 feet. For some reason, I let go of my hands and I fell and I hit my head on a rock and I had a concussion. Huh. And the teacher came over and she said, well, how do you feel? I said, I think I feel okay, but why don't you finish the day and ride home on the bus? And if you get home and you start throwing up or you want to sleep, you probably have a concussion. So I think I hold the record. I never got a certificate on it, but I think I was the only one that ever got a concussion at the old school. Well, I, I think my memory is still pretty good. But, so if I forget something here today, it's probably... Well, we called it the rock because it was basalt, which is next to diamond, the hardest rock there is. And it was south of the Folsom House and the, and the Methodist Church. And uh, the basalt was uh, from the Mount Duluth, which was uh, lava that flowed hot all the way. And, the, and it, it really ended up, that, that flow ended up by this side of Stillwater. That's, a, that's a, when it cooled down. And not only that, like Duane said, uh, 
So uh, what did we have in our playground? Crush rock. <laughs> we never saw a blade of grass as well. We always played touch football. We never played tackle. <laughs> was that school called the Kingsbury School? Kingsbury. Yes. Yeah, yeah, originally. Yeah, yeah. Originally. yeah. Okay, so did you guys have, we'll go start this way, any favorite teachers that you remember? Well, they were all good teachers. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. But one was my football coach, basketball coach, Tom Drury. And was Tom that? was there about three, four years. And, and if I can say one thing about Tom, uh, he was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I probably wouldn't have gone into education without him. And I can tell a quick story about Tom because he was so square and so honest and, and really, I think, uh, was a pure coach and a teacher. But one day he came down in the locker room and, and some of the boys we were fooling around. And so I had tripped over what was called a powder box. And it was for your feet so you wouldn't get, you know, disease on your feet. And so Tom came over and he said, all right, who tipped all, the, all this powder all over? And he looked at me and said, Dwayne, did you do it? I said, no, I, I, I didn't do it. So that's the only lie I've ever made. And I really regret it to this day. <laughs> but anyhow, it was not a big deal. But Tom was a special person in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say, with, you know, he gave me one other chance too. It was, I, I didn't fail, I didn't do very well in a biology class. And I said, Tom, could I take that over? Yeah, he said, you can take it over, see if you get a better grade. Oh, <laughs> and I got a better grade. He said, okay, I'll give you the better grade. Oh, yeah, so just a, just a dear gentleman, He's still alive. <clears throat> well, um, teachers didn't like me, and they had a reason to be a brat. <laughs> and uh, so it, in those days, you could take people by the ear, or you could pull their hair, or you could take a three-corner ruler and break it over there. So I had all of them. And uh, one experience, and it just shows the difference in uh, a parent support. Um, when, when I was in elementary, uh, at that time, the teachers could ride the school bus to school if they were on the line. And I won't mention the teacher's name. She turned out to be after school, a very good friend of mine. But um, she had her daughter, and her daughter had long pigtails, and I started pulling her pigtails. And um, she went up and told her mother, this is how dumb I was. I didn't stop. <laughs> and she came back there, she was a big woman, and she started slapping me. So when I got off the bus, my ears were ringing. And they took me over, they, they called up, uh, uh, taxi Pete down, downtown and he took me over to the clinic because they thought I broke my eardrum. Oh, I can never forget the letter that my parents read from the school and my dad looked up and he said, did you have it coming? And I said, I did. He said, go out and do the chores. And that was it. <laughs> did you have a favorite teacher? Uh, a name. Come on, Jerry, answer. I, <laughs> Uh, Holger Moberg, everybody. Yeah. Holger Moberg, who was, uh, I think, the math teacher plus for 30, 40 some years. Uh, he was a music teacher. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say. I mean, he tried, he tried harder than anybody else to get me through school. Um, I would second that, that E. Holger Moberg, and I don't know when he started teaching, but you know when you're young and you think people are so old, right? And when I would have classmates whose parents and maybe grandparents had him too, I just thought, oh my gosh, who could teach that long? Well, now I know. But um, he was so brilliant. He was, a, he was a very interesting person, but he was such an excellent teacher. And I, and I really learned how much so later on um, when I went into education and learned about uh, methods of teaching where you build everything on other, other knowledge and you spiral. And then he had these things called 90% uh, tests. I don't know if he had them when you guys went, but you had to get 90% on a test. 
So you had to take, you, he let you take it as many times as you, you needed to. But he taught math eighth, when I was going to school, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade math. Because we had small classes, so he taught each level. And sometimes I wonder, I, I think he actually had a, a major or minor in something like Latin or Greek or something really obscure that we would never have, have taught. And I know he was named, it was at least a finalist as a Minnesota State teacher. He was a, an amazing teacher. And then he had, um, of course, of his kids, I think several of them went into teaching, including Mike Bloomberg, who, who, who I taught with at the elementary school. He went and into actually, excuse me, but Mike taught in Holbrook's room. Yeah, I, yep, he did, he did. And uh, well, we're, we're, that was Mr. Moberg's room later on. Right, Because when I was there. Yeah, yeah, when you were there. And, uh, but he was, he was, I would say he was a character, but he was also just a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher. Uh, my favorite high school teacher was Norm Nagasawa, who is still alive and he's, um, uh, my girlfriends and I still get together with him in the summertime. Um, he just, he just lived such an interesting, interesting life. And, um, and he was a, biz a business teacher, and I only ever had one class from him, which was personal typing, typewriter, <laughs> that was terrible. But he taught all the business classes, and he was our student council um, advisor as well. And I was uh, always on the student council, and I was a student council president when I was a senior. And, and uh, I mean, Jerry mentioned this earlier, but, or, and Dwayne too, but we had such a small school. You could be in everything. And um, I was kind of bossy, so they let me be in charge of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but Norm was, oh, and he was also the um, uh, news, newsletter and yearbook uh, advisor as well. And he's just, he's just, a, and Norm worked there when you. Right, he was there when I got there in 80. Just, just uh, really connected with the kids and, and just a, a Gem of a gem of a human being. Um, we had a lot of young teachers when I was there in the high school, like a lot of new teachers that went into the high school. Um, the elementary school, j just about all my siblings, I have five siblings, and we all had the same first grade teacher, second grade teacher, third grade teacher, and so on and so forth. And our, we all had for sixth grade, we had Mrs. Um, Jeanette Pearson, who has since passed away, but. She was the person in my life that I wanted to emulate. I just thought, I want to be a teacher. I want to connect with kids and make them feel the way she made me feel. And there's no other way to put it, but except for that she looked like Aunt B from, from Mayberry. And she had this big old bosom, you know. I think a lot of our teachers, <coughs> elementary teachers, they, they maybe taught before they had children, then they were retired because you know, they couldn't be teaching when they were in the family way, and then had their children, and then they came back to teaching. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them were, were older um, women, and they were grandmothers, you know. But when if you felt bad about something, Mrs. Pearson, she'd just take you right into her big old bosom. She'd just hug you. She'd love you. She had this operatic voice, and every week, um, I think on Mondays or something, we would sing um, uh, the Minnesota State song, and she would sing, Minnesota, hail to thee. She's this beautiful operatic voice. Uh, not like that. But, and she was just an amazing woman. She impacted so many people's lives. But, but I remember every teacher I ever had. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I think teachers that, loved me, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> I was the opposite. <laughs> I think another teacher, now that you mentioned it, that it was, uh, I think it was when I was a sophomore, uh, the egg teacher, Dr. I'm not Dr. Mr. Uh, Brandon, and uh, he squared me away because up until that time I was nothing but trouble. I tell you, he got me down on that <laughs> on that um, um, shop floor and started pounding my head on the floor and said, "And you either better straighten up, you're not going to make it." Or, and I straightened up. Um, <laughs> But also, it's hard for me to separate elementary, the old school, and the new school, because 
you know, we had the same superintendent. There were a lot of people that taught in eighth grade and that. And I was telling um, um, Noel, I, I hope she gets to the war afterward, but uh, Lila, uh, uh, Clayton Rivard told me that when he graduated in 51, and at that time, the high school only had five teachers because the war took so many of them. And, and when they came back, uh, three of the five men teachers they had um, had went to service, and two of them were in concentration camps. And one of them was Mr. Adams, who was the basketball coach. He was so skinny that he could not wear a suit because it fell off. And so, um, yeah, and so, and then we had, of course, our our superintendent, I don't know if Dwayne remembers him, but because uh, that was he was in elementary, but he was my elementary superintendent, and then he went on to uh, the high school when I was in high school. Um, Mr. Clausen, who always had a, a cough, Luden's cough drop in his mouth, and we had Friday pep fests, and he was always down there in that old gym floor and would stand there, but he would never say a word until his cough drop was gone. And he, um, he, he, would, uh, he only would lived a, a few blocks from the school, but he, in really cold days, he would drive it over there, and he figured, well, he better let it run for a little while, warm it up. Well, he always forgot the fact that he was running, and so he'd come out later, because nobody would tell, <laughs> tell him that the motor was running, and so he was either out of gas or, Later on, he'd have to look out and said, oh my gosh, my car's still running. Uh, my favorite heroes uh, when I was in elementary was the class of 1948. And then it was 17 boys and three girls. One was Jeanette Dahlquist. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, they were on his case all the time. As a matter of fact, there's rumor that they drove, drove him out of there. <laughs> but. Um, I had two cousins that were in that class, and so they decided one day that they were going to go to the city and shop. Well, it was raining like crazy, and um, so they went up to ask Mr. Clausen if they could go home and um, uh, harvest um, clover seed. And as with his with his cough drop, he looks out the window and he said, "Well, boys." Uh, you know, it's raining pretty hard, and Eugene said, well, it isn't getting any uh, drier, and so he let him go. And they all, our, our uh, janitor was Wilbur Murray. He was a nice guy, especially to the eighth grade, uh, to the high school boys, <coughs> especially 48. And so for, at Christmas time, they bottle, bought him a bottle of booze, and they went down and shared it with him uh, while they had a few smokes and that. But, that was my favorite clan. Um, but anyway, uh, and of course the old gym, the old gym, the only level spot in the gym, that old gym, was the center circle. Because if you put the, the ball any place else, it rolled either north or south. Um, and we always had homecoming uh, during the winter. And uh, uh, they had the crowning of the king during halftime when the boy should have been down catching heck for not doing very well they were up there getting crowned and so at halftime the one of the refs would always put the ball in the on that center court and it would roll down the other end so but there were some of the memories. So Joe, any favorite teachers? Well, well I didn't, you know, I worked with I tremendous teachers, but the person who probably had the biggest impact on my life uh, in education, uh, helping me to kind of really became a, a mentor of mine, uh, was uh, Sig Rimstead. And uh, I know Jerry was on the board when they hired Sig, I think it was in 1977. And I came there in 1980, Sig hired me. And uh, I'll just... I'll give you a couple examples of, of kind of why I, I feel that way. One is, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of a story. Sig always, later on he told me, he says, I can decide if in five minutes whether I want to hire a person. Um, it's kind of like you don't get a second chance to make a first impression, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember I came up there for my interview 
uh, with my wife, Dawn, and uh, we came, came, he met us, you know, both to the school, uh, met us up at the school and walked in his office. We sat down, and shook his hand, and he slid a contract across. Hadn't had any questions yet. And he said, here, he said, here's the contract, uh, I'd like you to sign it. And uh, my wife looks at me, I look at her, and I'm going, okay. First thing you think about, okay, he wants to have me up here, he doesn't know me real well because I just all he has going off with my resume. And uh, the other thing is, what's he hiding? <laughs> Why does he want to hire a teacher so quick that uh, he's not giving me an opportunity? I said, well, you know, uh, that's great. I, I said, I appreciate this, but I like to have uh, a few questions answered. And my wife has a few questions about the area. I mean, she's a nurse and she's looking at opportunities where she can work too. And he said, oh, sure, sure. We, you know, so we spent some time together and he uh, gave me a tour of the building and actually, uh, actually took, gave us a little tour of the area. And I went back to his office and he pushed that contract across again and said, you know, and I said, well, I said, yeah, I, uh, I, I do appreciate the offer. And, uh, you know, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, I will sign it. And I asked him later on, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, why, and I told you this was in five minutes, he said, because you had a strong handshake and you had good eye contact. And he says, I've interviewed a lot of people over my lifetime. And I, he said, almost to a T, the ones who didn't have a real strong handshake or also didn't have good eye contact, they never stuck around as teachers very long. Not just in his schools that he was administrator, but also in other schools. Um, the other thing that he taught me was people won't care what you know until they know you care. And I think it's important is, uh, I think he, you know, if everybody would follow that rule, we wouldn't have some of the issues we have today in our society. And I think you know, because of his mentorship, because he was such a great example of what an administrator should be, uh, it really influenced me into wanting to be, you know, not just a teacher, and I'm not downgrading teachers, but to go in to administration where I can maybe even do more for kids and families than just as a teacher when you have your, you have your own class, but maybe uh, do a little something more. Plus, he was very innovative. He started the Padilla program, which everybody in the whole school, custodians, everybody, had a group of kids that you read with. Every week, for one hour, we had reading throughout the whole school, whether it be kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade, whatever kids were in your class at that time, or if there were kids who were, let's say, not assigned to a particular class, the cooks, the, the, the custodians, everyone would read. And, and you basically had different books that, that you could choose from. And it, it was a tremendous opportunity to promote that. Cool. And, uh, and again, he, many other innovations uh, that he, that he but again, big influence on my life, but just uh, an administrator that I'll never, uh, never forget. One other SIG story. I think I did this when I was interviewed last time, but I started being on the school board in 1977. And, our first job was, as a school board, was to hire a new superintendent. And we just met in, at, the, I call it Joe's office there, and um, the six board members, five of them were still alive. Um, and um, we didn't have a script or anything, we just asked our own questions. So being a teacher from Minneapolis, I thought I knew everything about education. So my question to Sig was, uh, do you believe in reading groups? And he said, everybody has reading groups. They all have their buzzards and their bluebirds. <laughs> I said, that's my man. I want him. Well, one other thing too, when I came back, uh, like I said, I was 1980 as a teacher, I came back uh, to TF um, after the consolidation. I mean, I'm still in the district, but I came back as principal, elementary principal 2001, and SIG's office was, became my office, and his desk was in there, his cabinets and everything, and I walked in, and uh, I know uh, I had the opportunity because the new soup said, well, Joe, we'll get you a new desk and some cabinets. I said, no, no. I said, these are good enough for Mr. Rim said, they're certainly good enough for me. So. Yeah. I think one of the things that we talk about all the good teachers, but we never had a discipline problem in Taylor's Falls. Except for Jerry. Well, that's, that's <laughs> beside the point. I mean, so and he identified himself as that. <laughs> we had a, a principal at the time that if you were called in 
first thing he would do, he had a rubber hose about that long, a garden hose here, and he'd hit that table so hard that if you were sitting there, it'd wake you up. And so the, the, some of the boys in our class, you know, not to be mean, but just to have a little fun. So he had to supervise lunch one day. So a couple of boys snuck in there with a scissor and they cut up his hose and put it nicely on his desk. And he came back in and there was his hose all cut up. And all right, he said, I think I know who did it. Come on in. And so a couple of boys had to go in and nobody admitted what they did, but it was the respect that I think the boys did because they respected him and authority. But we never had a lot of it. You got called in once, twice, your parents got called, and the parents would say, good, you deserve it. So there wasn't a problem. I don't think we had anybody sent home. It was you know, the discipline that goes with it. So, but that's kind of, you know, there were good teachers, excellent yeah. teachers. And well, I, mean, I mentioned the, uh, <laughs> the good teacher, the egg teacher that straightened me out. Well, when he left, I was absolutely depressed, and we got another teacher that was absolutely hopeless, <laughs> and also he taught, tried to teach, well, he tried to teach me was a problem, but he taught, I think, chemistry or something like that. He knew um, how, to, how I could, I knew how to get his goat. So when he mumbled, mumbled, he stood up there and I would say, Mr., I won't say his name, um, uh, sir, would you, would you repeat the question? And he came back and he said, Vitalis, clean out your ears. And I said, get the out of your mouth. And uh, <laughs> down to the superintendent, Mr. Dahl. And he said, I want this guy out of here. And Mr. Dahl said, well, we can't get rid of him. He's a leading foot, uh, scorer on the football team. <laughs> Okay, changing the subject a little bit. Tell me about lunch at Taylor's Falls High School. Well, when, when I was at, in 1960, when I started first grade, um, the school was probably the same structure as when you guys graduated. And so in the elementary school, okay, now when you go into the lobby, um, there's this like sort of a hallway, a small area that is um, where our cop we have a copy machine and it's a small workroom. That was where there was a, um, uh, an opening and the room now that is the um, health room, that was the kitchen. That was the kitchen when you guys were there too, right? And so the elementary kids would have our little trays and we would go through that area that's the workroom now it's just a hallway and then and they would open that up and they would put your food on your tray then we would walk around and we would go back to our classrooms and that's where we would have our that's where we would have our lunch now in those days um every day um so that was like first and then to second grade uh, I'll, t I'll tell you the reason for that in a minute but um and then one person who was like the person for the week or, or whatever, they would stand up and they would say their prayer. They would say, so in those days, you were either Catholic, Lutheran, and the occasional Methodist. I think that was before they even built the Baptist, well, or Baptist. And um, so very diverse. <laughs> <laughs> So that person would say, stand up and they would say the prayer, if you can imagine, uh, of their family's religion. And then everybody would eat and then you would take your trays back. The high school people would go down, get their tray, go through, and then they would have unfolded the tables in the gym. And that's where they would have, that's where they would have lunch. When I was, um, when I started second grade, that's when they built on a, another section, not uh, of the school, a section that was like um, two new classrooms, um, like the, the first and second grade classrooms, or now that are two first grades right. at the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was first and second. And then the multi-purpose room. Mm -hmm. 
We were so excited, which is what our lunchroom is now, but it was called the multi-purpose room. And that would be where the choir would practice, the band would practice, and then they had like a small music room where the kids would get their individual music lessons connected to that. And, and that was then the, became the lunchroom for everybody. During that year when they were adding on those rooms, they sent the first grade kids across the street and they had class in the basement of the Baptist church, which was much smaller then. And in the second graders, us, we would go and have our classes in the basement of the Lutheran church that was just also nearby. And then I think halfway through the year we moved back into the, into the school. But that multi-purpose room, that's where we had our prom and homecoming, mm -hmm. not in the gym. The, they used the gym in the 50s and 60s, and then when they built the multi-purpose room, then that, that was where we, we had, would have prom and homecoming. And we would decorate it like you couldn't believe, you know, we, like when we were juniors, you'd spend all year saving your money, sure. and then the chicken wire, the tissues, you know. And we also had bands for those, for those two. But yeah, the multi-purpose room, which seemed huge when I was young, the lunch room. Uh, and one? now it just seems so small. Yeah. <laughs> There's I, so many children. <laughs> but that was what lunch was At one was time like. I asked Leland Rivard, who's I think 93 years old now, and I asked him when they started the lunch program in Tillersville. And he said he thought it was about 1944. Up until that time, they had to, they moved the shop out of the. And this is Kingsbury. Well, it was the the, the one that replaced Kingsbury. It was right. the high school. Right. It was right. the high school up there. Uh, they moved the. Uh, they had to move the shop out because of the kitchen, and they moved that to. There was a uh, somebody that lived in town that donated his garage. It was not too far from the uh, Methodist Church. So we had our shop classes over there. We had to walk about a half a mile, mile <laughs> to that one. And um, that's, when they and that, that's when they put in the new um, uh, lunchroom. And we, when I was in elementary through eighth grade, we carried, took our trays back to the classroom and ate. Mm -hmm. When we were in high school, we took that to that old cement bleachers in the old gym and ate. When we got to the new school, the only thing that was different is we were sitting on wood benches rather than cement. Um, and, um, yeah, so, but anyway, back, back to the, I'm just gonna go off kilter a little bit here, but. Back to our preps, there's no such a thing as prep times. You didn't have anything like that. So we had the, the shop, once a week we went over to the shop. Once a week, and at least in elementary, I think Duane was a part of that too, we walked down to the public library, which was across from the Catholic Church, which had to be over a mile, for to get a story from Mrs. Miss Murdoch. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, we, the boys, went up to um, the flats, which is where the new school is. And um, uh, we would have flag football. That, that was our prep time. <laughs> well, lunch was a favorite time for me because, as <clears throat> Deb said, you know, we all, Every year they changed, so our eating was in the bleachers. We'd go through the line, go up there quickly. Once in a while, they'd serve like sauerkraut for, not for the Swedes, but for other oh, people. The Germans. And I'd say, just give me a little bit. <laughs> well, no, here, we have extra. <laughs> so I would hurry up, this is my routine. I'd hurry up and eat, so I could grab a basketball, because we had 20 minutes to eat. So the first five minutes with eating, I had 15 minutes that I could go grab a basketball and then some of the boys would play basketball. And then the bell would ring and then I'd still be shooting and so on. So we ate in the bleachers. And, okay. and so that was different than what you how had indicated. How but long was your lunch time? It was about 20 minutes, roughly. That sounds, that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I remember that because that was my fun time in between <laughs> classes and geometry and 
Yeah. But I would definitely say <clears throat> we had really good meals. Yeah. I mean, they they were everything was from scratch. Yeah. Everything was yeah. you know cooked from scratch, and there was. You know, there was basic meals that we still make fun of, pennies from heaven, you know, the sliced hot dogs and the scalp potatoes and stuff like that. Lutefisk. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there was Lutefisk. <laughs> some, some of it, I think, was government surplus. Sure, oh, but I mean, it was, we the always thought... Extra cheese and extra But they knew how to make it. They knew how to serve it. Yeah, I mean, yeah no. <laughs> but we always thought it was, it was really, really good. When I was in high school, um, I became vegetarian. So there, I think I probably didn't, eat than um, the school meals because it was they were pretty meat based but but um, but it, I just like I said I just remember always thinking my brothers um, we all enjoyed eating a lot you know we had my mom was a really good cook and I I just remembered our meals were really really good food we, well, we had, uh, 20 cents that's what it cost yeah. 20 cents a meal punch your ticket when I was yeah, there uh, as a teacher and coach um, we had uh, Mrs. Nordine was mm -hmm. our was our head cook, mm -hmm. and matter of fact, she was also there when I was principal mm -hmm. later on. But anyway, being a student council advisor, we'd always sponsor a spaghetti dinner. And usually it was in the fall of the year, and that was a fundraiser for us. So the student council members, myself mm -hmm. and Mrs. Nordine, she always she had to be there to help prepare and everything like that. And it was funny because we would use the same spaghetti. <clears throat> Uh, that we used at school. I mean, that she, you know, made for uh, lunches. You know, probably once, a couple times a month, mm -hmm. and also uh, the meat sauce and everything. And it was interesting because through the government, you have certain rules and regulations on how much hamburger you have to add in and things like that. Well, when we had those spaghetti dinners. We didn't have to follow the government rules, so we kind of cut back on the hamburger, so we'd save more money and make more money on the spaghetti <laughs> dinner. And the kids would come through there, and the families. And, you know, it, it's just that power of suggestion. We, we tell them that uh, this is an old family recipe <laughs> that, that only a few people know how to make. And Mrs. Nardine is one of them. And she only will make it at this time. And that wherever we be kids, we have spaghetti during the, during the week and stuff, they're at school. They say, oh, Mrs. Nardine, can't you make that great spaghetti and sauce that you made for the spaghetti dinner? That is so good. I don't know why you can't do that. And she would just... She look at me and she's going, see what you started? <laughs> but again, it, it was it was that, that again, that small atmosphere and everyone kind of having fun. Whatever you did, that's one thing too, I should say. Wherever you did at Taylor's Falls School, uh, it was always fun. There was always, you know, either whether the classes you learned, but there were always fun things to do. And I think having everyone in the same building from kindergarten all the way up, everybody looked out for each other. You had mentors. Uh, you're, I mean, you know, a lot nowadays if you talk to uh, kids at the high school, or at the middle school rather, or even elementary, who are their heroes, they'll mention professional athletes, they'll mention, uh, you know, maybe there's an actor or whatever like this. If you talk to some of the kids way back when, those elementary kids, who are their heroes? Well, they're sitting over here to the left of me because these are the kids, the ones who were in high school and participating in things. That's who the girls looked up to, the boys looked up to, and... Uh, they came to the games. It, it's all changed in, in that respect. There's still a little bit of that, mm -hmm. but I think it's because it, once you get bigger, there's more opportunities, but also it takes away from that kind of that hometown feel. Well, you continued uh, pulling the wool over the eyes for the kids up till you left Tillers Falls by remember when you would, once a year you would... Uh, the hot dogs? The hot dogs. <laughs> Tell them about that. Well, as principal, we, uh, I started, uh, we thought we'd have something special in the in, in the, the spring of the year, where I would cook for uh, I would cook for all the kids. I would cook for all the kids, and again, you have to follow certain rules and regulations that you know the federal government has with you know, hot lunches and things like that. And so they would have to actually, you know, uh, cook the hot dogs pretty much in the kitchen, and I'd, I'd bring them out and I'd just put them on the grill, put the marks on them, and we take them back in. And then the cooks would serve them, and the, you go in there, and those kids would say, "Oh my gosh, Mister, these are the best! How come we can't have these when they have the regular hot dogs? You know, they're the same hot dog." But again, it's that idea of uh, maybe it was because of the little charcoal taste out there, or whatever, that the kids really liked it. But but uh, again, Mrs. Nordine, Luann would she'd see me after the meal, and she'd go, "You know, 
I don't want you to cook anything <laughs> because then I take the heat because we don't do it. And it's the same stuff we always do. <laughs> so yeah. it, but it was always fun. The always kids fun. always look forward to that. <laughs> um, just to uh, piggyback on something Joe said about the when it was K, you know, K through 12 or for 1 through 12, that community. I think that people, um, and we do it in different ways now. It's not, a ma it's not a matter of, oh, it used to be so wonderful and now it's not. No, that, not at all. But at that time, I would say, when we all were coming up, that um, when you lived in the country, as we do, there are three important spheres in your life. There's family, there's your church, and there's your school. And all of those, those were, that was your community. And because all the kids, and again, we had larger families then, you know, we only had six in our family, and all the Greens had 15, uh, you know, I mean, so you went to school, you got on the bus at the same time with your older siblings, they always looked after you, the older kids always looked after the younger kids, no little kid would get picked on, on the bus, I mean, that's just so unthinkable, because the big kids would look after the, the younger kids. And just like Joe said, the younger kids, I remember when I was in elementary school, the, 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 the ones that were the juniors and seniors that were the leaders in the high school, you know, and I knew, they didn't know who I was, but I knew who they were. And I, you know, you looked up to them, you really did. And, um, but that, that community sense, that's when people came together at the sporting events, the class plays, you know, um, the graduation. I mean, people came to the class plays, not just like the family. Everybody just came to the class plays. It was, it was, that was, that was, that was life. You know, it was your family, it was your church community, and it was a school community. And they, they all, it all came together. And like I said, now people have communities in different ways. You know, we, they have you know, uh, the sport leagues and all the different things that you have now, and the Girl Scouts, what, that, which is great. But it was just, it was so important. And I think that when, I don't know if you're going to ask about the consolidation specifically, because we weren't, I was not living in this area when that happened. Mm -hmm. But I know for people who had, uh, my parents' generation, people who had um, had their kids go all the way through the school, that it was heartbreaking to them in many ways because we were the Blue Jays, you know. We were, now we were going to be part of this, you know, this uh, wider community. Um, there's no doubt it had to happen once there was open enrollment and, and the class size, you know, because people would go to a school where there were more class, op, you know, more um, subject opportunities and they could take classes and they could take AP classes and they could take all that. And, and the high school at Taylor's Falls just couldn't offer that anymore. So, I mean, it was inevitable that that would happen. Um, but it's also true that there was there's something lost when that happens when when all the little towns don't have their schools anymore, mm -hmm. and and you know because I heard oh I would have to be part of that school I said well you have to look at what the, is best for the kids you know and what's going to happen, but there was something about that's why I call was, Taylor's Falls Elementary uh, one of the few rural schools within a bigger district and I breed, I, I believe that. And I think I will to my dying day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I look back at personally is the opportunity of the small school. But um, it, it's one of my little stories I tell that because I was a pretty good athlete as a sophomore and a junior. <clears throat> and the coach that left at the end of my junior year had a chance to go out to the new high school. So he approached me, he said, uh, if, if I get the job as football or basketball coach at the new school, would you transfer out to the new school? And so I looked at him, I said, no, my commitment is to Taylor's Falls. I'm, I'm for the small guy, I will always be for the small guy, the underdog, and I, chances are that I would never do that, but I appreciate the opportunity. So in our championship football game, who do we play? We play mm -hmm. Chicago City. Mm -hmm. And so we, we almost beat them, but our line was 135 pounds at that time. Chicago City was 185 pounds. <laughs> and we almost had a chance to beat them. We were ahead at halftime 6 nothing, 
and they came back and intercepted some passes and fumbled because our kids, you know, when you have a 185 pound guy, and I told the line, I was quoted by, I said, all you do is stand. Don't do anything, just get in their way. Don't try to hit them. If they push you around, don't fall down, just stand there. And our backfield was really fast. And I said, we'll, we'll follow the blocking. And so anyhow, after the game was over, I went up to the player and I said, you know, thanks for competing because we were the underdog, but uh, we were the smallest and we always the underdog. I don't know if we were ever favored to win a game, Jerry. It was always, you know, we should lose by 20, 30 points. But I always remember that, that, that my commitment was always to the small school because they never had the chance. But once in a while, our team were undefeated. So you had basketball teams that Oh, a district champ. Speak, speaking of sports, because you just rotated into that, what kind of sports did Taylor Smalls offer for girls or boys? And girls, nothing. <laughs> oh, come on now, Jerry. No, no oh, sports. Okay. Not when I went and to school. Did they have volleyball? Or did they have cheerleading? Or did no. they have cheerleading? And cheerleading, not a sport. No. <laughs> so I will address this as being the lone woman on, on this panel. Um, so it was so inequitable. It was so inequitable. It was all, all boys. We had, in the years that I was at school there, we had football, basketball, uh, baseball, and track and field. And someone mentioned earlier that because we were such a small school, anybody could be on any team. You didn't have to like, uh, is it audition for sports? And you try out. Tryouts. You didn't have to, and they wear costumes. My husband goes, they're not costumes, they're uniforms, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway, so, so, but anybody could be on a team. And, and the coaches were always good, I thought, about just letting everybody play. And when I was in high school, the four years I was in high school, we rarely won any games. But we had a really good pep club. And everybody, and the other schools would all say to us, you know, because we would never, we were, I, you know, we had staunch rules, no booing, no hissing, cheer, be a good sports, whatever. And, and they would always say, you know, you guys have the best team spirit we have ever seen. We would hear that time and time again, you know, and it was like, well, something we had, you know. So, but I know there were a few years when, when I think around 67, 68, when we did have some really good um, um, Jim Grandstrand in those years that they did have like conference champs or something. But for the most, most of the time, you know, they didn't. But so all this stuff was for the boys. So I would try to get in anywhere I could. Like I did stats for the baseball team for, uh, for a while. And then I would um, um, help out with the, with the basketball team, you know. And, then, and they would have buses at, in those days that took the country kids home after practice. Practice would be right after school. And then the buses, one would go north, one would go south, and they'd take the kids home. But then, finally, I'm a senior, 1972-73. Title IX. <laughs> Title IX. Now the girls will have every equal opportunity that a boy has, right? In your school? Right. So when I was a senior, we had volleyball and basketball and track offered for girls. And I was on the basketball team. Total equal opportunity. The boys still got the gym every day after <laughs> school, and then the buses took them home. We had to find our own way in at six in the morning so we could use the gym for practice. Um, no, no money was put out whatsoever. We had to wear the most disgusting <laughs> gym uniforms we had. They were called rompers. And we had to wear those, those were our uniforms. Rompers. And we played six man, six woman basketball, three offense and three defense. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it is a horrible way to play basketball because I guess we were so delicate. You could only dribble two times and then you had to pass the ball. <laughs> and the, if you were offense, you had to stay on one side of the board. If you were defense, because we couldn't, walk, we couldn't run that whole distance, you know. And, uh, and then when we did have games, there was no admission or anything like that, you know. And the boys would come and heckle us. They would come and just make fun of us because we were, we were bad. There's no doubt about it. We were really bad. Uh, my, one of my most memorable uh, things was when I was the high scorer of a game, 
I made six points at three baskets. That was high score of a game. Um, but it was just like, it was not equitable. And so, but that was in 1973, and I would say by 1980, and you knew there, I mean, the girls had just, were powerhouses. My, my sister, my younger sister was on the volleyball team. The volleyball team was really strong. The track team, Kathy Nasman, those, I mean, the, that, that was maybe a little before you, but they, they just soared ahead. And so it takes time. I get that. The only that. ones they lost to was... Moose Lake, wasn't it the Ad Adamsack? Yeah, later on in the 80s, it was the Adams Adamsack and the Birds so Moose uh, Lake. Uh, they always went. But they had, always, like, during the time I history. was there, Laura Hilger, she was a state champion. You had uh, the volleyball teams were, were excellent. I mean, your daughter played on the volleyball team. They were, they were conference champs. So, again, it was it had, it had, uh, it, it had gotten, uh, you know, much better. So, in a period of seven years, and I'm not sure how much mm -hmm. further back, you know, after... 73, 73, you know, how much, but again, it was one of those things where it had to, it had to build mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's, 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 you, you like to see it just happen all at once, but it, but it takes time and, you know, girls started, you know, doing more of the sport in the summer and doing some things just like the guys were doing at that point. And actually during uh, the middle eighties, you know, the girls teams are actually better than the boys teams. And I, 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 I don't feel bad, but I was coaching the boys at the time and, and the girls had very good athletes. Uh, the boys had athletes, but we also played, you know, some of the teams we were playing were very good too. So again, it was, they were always competitive, but I would say during a lot of that time, uh, the girls teams actually uh, were more the conference champs and uh, more of them went on to state uh, in some of the, like, track and some of those things. But it was, uh, again, it was, but you had the opportunities, but there weren't a ton of sports. Well, I got interested in, excuse me, I got interested in basketball and sports when I was in fifth grade. And I followed some very good basketball teams um, at Taylor's Falls. We had the Selmans and the Westlands and the Rivards and the Barclays. And they were, I mean, the number one game in the year was when they played Chai High for the conference champions. And I remember Roger Hegstrom broke his leg during one of those games. And I, I, I tell her fall, I wondered if they were ever going to get out of that gym. It was just a, a, an accident, but still. And then they were good in football too, very good in football. And that time they played their football games on the flats. And, um, and it was Clayton Rivard that told me that over a period of five years, they went from a uh, six man to nine man to 11 man in five years. And so by the time that we consolidate, by the time that we moved to the new school in summer vacation, winter vacation, uh, 1952, um, 53, uh, that winter, none of our boys had no practice, no place to practice until they came into the new school. And so they didn't win a game that their junior year. In football, we had no place to practice. We practiced on the clay and the gravel that was left over from filling in after the new school. And that, that's when we started playing our home games at St. Croix Falls. And, uh, and I don't know what time. When you, were in, when you were in school, they played at St. Croix too? Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. Because they did yeah. when I in, in my, my high school. Junior and senior year, we played at, at St. Oh. Croix Falls, our home games. Because we didn't have a field at all. At all. Oh, and I don't know what year you got a, a three, four years difference. We had a solid field, yeah. beautiful field. Yeah. They, they had new recreation there. We played afternoon and, games. And the games would be at like one o'clock. One o'clock. Because yeah. you know, we didn't we have lights. One. We had the one at three and then yeah. the rest of the world. Well, see, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, uh, it was good that we did, had to play on gravel and run, because we, we couldn't get used to grass anyway. We would have gotten hurt all the time if we had grass. <laughs> Well, Jerry, you have to tell the story. You know, we talk about underdogs, but back when you told the story many times about playing, I think it was Finlayson or Hinckley, that they had service boys coming back from the service and then they'd oh, finish their high school. That was back in the days, again, back to the war. Uh, a lot of the, from Pine City, a lot of those kids, uh, those uh, in that class, they went into the service. 
and they were playing the Quantico Marines in the service. But you could come back, those kids could come back and play till they were 21. So here they came back from the war, and Taylor's Falls had such a good team that the only ones we lost to was the district champion was to Pine City. The Boos, and there was a couple other guys. Well, they went as far as the region finals, and they played um, um, Duluth Central. Well, they went out and got snockered up the <laughs> night before, plus the fact they had green mustaches and they painted them green. They painted their mustaches that green. That color. was a school color. And they got tromped, you know, and the, they should have been in the state, but... Uh, but there was no classes at that time, so the big school... No, no it was only school. one school, yeah. Okay, so uh, since we're no, talking we always about, the underdog. Yeah. <laughs> since we're talking about sports, and we t I mentioned ahead of time, could we sing the school song? Can I could sing the school song. Would you join in? I mean, you guys, was it a different I don't school even song? Know. I can't, I can't school sing song? it. Well, She's got a good Joe thinks I was never there when they sang it. I was in the locker room talking <laughs> to the boys. <laughs> Joe yeah. thinks that that Mr. Christensen... I, I, I wrote, thought that Mr. Christensen either, either wrote the music or... Uh, I thought he wrote the music for the school song because it was Stand Up and Cheer. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, that was the name of the song. I, I was a cheerleader couple of years but anyways yes, everybody join in if anybody join in. Everybody. you know you, you know the, you know it but and I'm not a good singer but uh, it goes stand up and cheer stand up and cheer for TF high school come on da, da, da. we got the best chance now let's go rah, rah, rah. Right, fellas, fight. We're going to win this game tonight. We got the team. We're on the beam. We're going to win for TF High. T A Y L O R S. No, that's not right. No, 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 no. No, that's what we said. B L U E J A Y S. Blue Jays, Blue Jays are the best. Up, that is hard. that still on the wall? It I think it is. That, that I one think is, it is. That version? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I started. So even, even the song said, win fellas. So yes. how did Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. B-L-U-E-J-A-Y-S. Blue Jays. Woo! <laughs> he can't but, get that but the school the had, the song has changed many times over the years. That's what you said. You yeah. said it was well, it used the only thing. thing was it was Notre Dame? The Notre Dame? Yeah. Uh, the, Notre Dame. the fight really, song was a Notre Dame. As an athlete, yeah. when I heard that song, yeah. my heart just yeah. because yeah. that yeah. Like yeah. Minnesota Rouse has got them really beat. Yeah. But the only thing that has yeah. not changed over the years has been the mascot of the U.S. Since 1940 has always been the Blue Jays. Since the 1940s. Yeah, that's when, in the yearbook. Yeah, and um, I think that it, the school actually had what they call, you know, a school song, not a fight song. And like an alma mater yeah, type song? Yeah, 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 but it's in one of those old annuals. But you talk, you talk about girls' sports. Back in 1916, 1917, there was a girls' basketball team. Yeah. In the yeah. very beginning, you know, there was girls' basketball. You know, and they'd play about four yeah. games. They'd play St. Croix twice, yeah. and then yeah. they'd play some other team. And one year, they were undefeated. They were 4-0. Mm -hmm. But that they disbanded year. because nobody would play that. That's right. The, so after two years, they had another team. Nobody would play them. <laughs> yeah. So that was the end of girls. Basketball. Though. Could you um, um, comment about uh, some characters that you knew in school? There's always either the class clown, or somebody got in trouble, or someone pulled a prank, or <laughs> some... with one. I thought you were sitting with one right here. Sure. Well, <laughs> but what, one of the things that I remember is not the trigonometry class or the slide rule and, and all that, but I remember the little pranks, and they were pranks. They were not mischievous, but. Uh, as the story goes, and it's been changed maybe over the years, but one morning the custodian came in and there was a skunk up the flight pool. Oh, and so flight he pool. quickly okay. took it down and got rid of it. And, and our English teacher, we, she was really tough. So one day the boys came in early and put a snake in her desk. And she freaked out and she had to go down to the superintendent. One day, uh, <laughs> probably a junior, 
we get there and all of a sudden here's an old farm buggy, the old time, and that was sitting atop of the gymnasium. And it was, they put it up there in pieces and then they put it together. What? And it, and they on top of the building? Top of the gymnasium, yeah. So they had to figure out how to get that down. So there were a lot of pranks being played. Not mischievous, nobody got hurt, but it was just kind of a joke thing. And so in our class, and there may have been other kids too, that periodically there'd be something. Who did it? Uh, we don't know who did it, but there was. Did you know? Well, you don't have to say names. I think, I think we, it was Dwayne Olson. Yeah, I think it was Dwayne Olson. I could tell you, there was Tori in my class, and it was one of them. Mm -hmm. Well, when I when I was in high school, um, there was a lot of Rivards back in those days. Another name for Taylor's Falls was Rivard, though, because they owned like six businesses, seven businesses in town, and um, there was always every class had a couple of Rivards in it. And some of those boys were mischievous, I'll use the kinder word. And um, Greg Rivard, if you want a character, I'll say his name, one of the funniest people ever to walk the face of the earth. His, his wife is still a, Susie is a teacher at the high school. But Greg was just, he was just like his dad. His dad, um, um, Phyllis and, and Miles. 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 Miles was known, all their dads were known for pranks. Like Miles flew a plane underneath, underneath the, bridge, the bridge, you know, on the river. And I mean, they were just always doing pranks and stuff like that when they were young. So Greg wanted to take that up, I think. But one of the things that he would mastermind every year is they would break into the school. I never could understand that, breaking into the school. But he would break into the school and at Thanksgiving time and they would get a turkey out of the freezer. And this was like, it was like a master plan. All, a lot of people were in on it, you know, how to get into the school. Not, you know, not cause any damage, but get into the school and get the turkey. And then they would roast, they would have this big turkey roast at, in a field someplace and all these people would go to it. That was one thing that happened for quite a few years. Um, and then something my own brother did, Steve Julek. Um, he, he and, I don't know, Jim Ansell and, Maybe Roger Gustafson and, and uh, Kurt Nelson and those guys, they had got into the school. Do you know where you go down the hall to where, um, um, who's, I think is a special ed room now, but it was, it was like a little uh, observation room. I don't, I don't, and now we just store things in there, but it didn't really go anyplace. And above it was an exit sign. It, must have gone out of the school at one point, but there was this exit sign up there forever. And um, that just drove my brother crazy. So he tin snipped, made a really, really nice sign with the same letters as exit, you know, those same type of letters. But it just said, bite. Because <laughs> they used to say this thing, bite off, you know, it was just like an insult to somebody. And I think it came back a few years ago, too. But anyway, so we tin snipped the word bite into it really nicely. They got into the school. They took out the exit sign. They put up the bite sign. Still had the light behind it. I mean, they didn't even shut off the light. And that sign was there for almost the whole year before. I mean, all, all the kids knew it. But the teachers, I think it was at least a year before <laughs> our principal found out about it. And they said, take that sign out of the, off of there. But... Uh, those well, you must have had some characters on your team. You know, we had, like I said, they were all they all were they all were good kids. You know, the kids that were like on the on the team, they just they played hard. I mean, we never cut anybody in a school our size. We didn't cut anybody. Anyone who came, not everybody got equal playing time because you, you wanted to have your best players out there. But we tried to get as many kids as we could into the game. Um, you know, there were characters that that weren't. Uh, you know, on the team that would come to the games, and again, I can't mention some of the uh, some of the names because they're still around. Uh, you, you were interesting. You were talking about uh, you know Greg Rivard. I think his son, when he was here at the high school, was uh, either Greg or Tim's son was one of the ones who. Uh, Started the streaking phase here at a football game, oh. <laughs> so that apple doesn't far fall too far. From we did the have trade. a streaker. We did have a, have a streaker, and he has he has since that. Uh, Elmer Getzler, mm -hmm. rest in rest in peace. He passed away some years ago. 
but what, during the streaking phase, which was more like in the 70s. I know, but here, but here they uh, must have been some uh, huh. people over there at KF talking among some kids. Huh. Because I remember when it was right after I left here as AD to become principal back at Taylor's Falls a couple of years later at one of the games, I think it was a homecoming game, uh, there was a person running across and uh, they, they didn't catch him. But they, they all knew by how he ran who it was. Uh, and anyway, the rumor was it was uh, actually a relative to one of the Rivards. I, I don't want to. I don't want to throw any names out there. They, but. That was a family that. You know, they live life to the fullest. They live all of them. That the, you know, from from, <clears throat> from AJ on down. You know, they work, work, work. They unbelievable work ethic, but yeah. unbelievable play ethic. I should, they just go out there and. Have I should tell one story. About, what they all were characters. I mean, if you talk about the older Rivards, the, the brothers, mm -hmm. I'll tell the story about Miles. It's a clean story, and uh, Miles again, as you heard, when Greg was. Uh, Greg was uh, his son, and I, I don't know all the other kids. I probably could, if you mentioned. Dr. Jeff Rivard. Oh, Jeff Rivard, sure. Yeah. And Joe was and Joe, and Joe. So anyway, uh, what happened one time, I was uh, down at the Springs. It was uh, the local bar in town, and I think it was uh, it was in the summer. We had done some stuff at the school, and we had stopped down. Uh, we always had camps and things for the kids, and afterwards the coaches would go down and have a beverage before we go home. I was in there, and, and Miles, you know, was uh, was in there. Miles and Kenny and uh, Vic Gustafson and uh, let me see, Eddie Gustafson, and they're all sitting there. And uh, I think Skip Lynch and uh, quite a crew we had all there sitting. And here's Miles all dressed up, and he had a he had a you know, nice sport coat, jacket, tie, and everything. Well, here this, and he was always a guy who was in overhauls, and you know, like a uh, kind of like either a flannel shirt or a uh, kind of a blue jean type shirt, you know. And and I go, Miles. I said, uh, you're all dressed up. I said, what, what's the occasion? Because none of the other people are dressed up. Oh, I said, I had to, had to go to a, a, a visitation over in, in uh, St. Croix. I said, oh, I said, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that. I said, uh, uh, close friend or family or something? Well, I was a, a pretty good friend, pretty good friend. And I said, well, what did he die from? Uh, well, nothing serious. <laughs> And I go, nothing serious. My, my, my house, he's dead, right? He goes, well, yeah. Well, I, I meant it's nothing. It's not like a cancer or something. But something else happened. But it wasn't anything. It wasn't anything catching. He's nothing <laughs> serious. And I always remember that story. So. I, love that. I can remember, as you say, there were families. It was the. Yeah, Vitalis, there was the Rivards, and there was the... Yeah. The Olsons. <laughs> well, when I was there, there was probably only two Olsons, and we were related. But it was always for us, and this was my feeling, how do I get into that group to be part of it? It was always, you know, playing a sport, and there were Rivards over here, and, guys, and then the families were sitting up there, and, and my folks, out of the three years, attended one game for me. Mm -hmm. And there were, no, that was, they had the farm. And so my junior year, we played Brush City. It was a non-conference game. So they, we didn't have bleachers. So they came to support me because they said, well, we'll come and see your afternoon football game. Well, about the second quarter, I come out of the game and I said, mom, we got a surprise. Missing a front tooth and the other one was chipped. Oh, she said, oh my God. Oh, she said, we got to go home. She said, you can take the car and go to the dentist. And oh, I don't remember driving from the school to the dentist at home because they probably had to pull out a, mm -hmm. you know, but that was my folks. And, but we always had a good crowd, you know, for athletic events. Well, Deb told the story to me when I first got back as principal, reminiscing. And uh, you probably don't remember this, but you said, you know, most of the the kids actually had to go to different towns to find dates because you don't want to date a relative. That's true. <laughs> That's true. But that was my goal too. We didn't keep to our side of the river <laughs> until later years. And right, people right. started going across the river, uh, dating people from Wisconsin. No, we, we had got, the ferry. So eventually, <laughs> oh, swim. You say you know uh, getting in with people, but eventually, you know, everybody married into somebody's yeah. family. <laughs> and we always say that you know when you start talking to people in Taylor's Falls. <laughs> 
uh, there's like one degree of separation. Yeah. You know, <laughs> forget the sex. Oh yeah, that's. You my don't want to say who does that person look like. <laughs> <laughs> And you want to be careful how you talk about people. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's true. And you should yeah. do that. We should do that anyways. But I mean, uh, everybody's connected to somebody else. On the activity you know, on the farm, Saturday night was always go down to the community center and they'd have a DJ. And so periodically, some of the boys, oh, let's go down and see who's there. And of course, we'd sit on one side of the old people, the girls would sit on the other side. And about an hour into it, oh, this is kind of boring, let's go have some fun someplace else. But that was our get together, you check out the other. Yeah, you know, see me. Yeah. And so that was my next leave. question, you guys. You stole my thunder. What was a typical weekend like? And also um, summer jobs, summer, summer. Um, what were summers like? And how did the river play into your life? Work on the farm. Work on the farm. Work on the farm. Well, on Saturday nights, when I was younger, uh, we always went to Schaefer. Uh, the apartment. There's apartments now that at one time was the modern store, and that was the biggest store in the whole area, including Lindstrom and St. Croix. And they, um, they had their own locker, so they had meats, the meat department, they sold clothing, uh, they brought in your eggs and exchanged them for money, uh, for goods. Uh, and Telford Johnston also owned the next store, which is now the saloon, which was a hardware store. And uh, he for, later he sold it to the Bankies. But anyway, and then um, next to that was the Schaefer 3 2 joint. And uh, uh, Nettie, so I remember. <laughs> Nettie was very well endowed. And um, the old farmers, they, would, they liked her very much. And uh, she would occasionally. Uh, get out her accordion, and they were just hoping that there something would happen between <laughs> the pressing of the accordion. So the women were shopping, uh, going to the harder store for the men, and then maybe stop at the uh, joint. And they had great movies up there. They had been 7,500 kids along the wall of the old Schaefer Creamery. Movies? Huh? Yeah, during the summer, that was all the different... They would project the movie on to no. the outside? And they did a good job. Five cents, so you come in there, no, no, you go shopping the parents, and then they'd have yeah. movies for the kids, you oh, sit, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. sit on the ground, yeah. and watch the... You know, it was great, it was oh. great. That was a big <laughs> thing. Big Schaefer was a big place on Saturday night. Wow. Are oh, you talk happening? about uh, what, what was it to do? Uh, and again, if, if you had somebody in the family that knew somebody, you had a connection for a job. Well, my brother worked for Stanley Station, right there at the bridge. And so when I was 14, they needed some help, and I went down and I started at 25 cents an hour. But then I got full time. So whenever I wanted to work, it was like Friday night or Saturday, Sunday during the summer, you, you could work virtually. You know, alone, and that paid for my college. And so Stanley was the owner, and he would. There were things you would learn from him that you wouldn't learn anywhere else about working for somebody. And I can remember one story that you would say, "Well, be prepared for the gypsies. The gypsies come to Taylor's Falls every summer. So if I'm not here, you lock everything up, and you call me." And then he said, we will wipe the counter and we will you know, lock up everything. And so every summer while I worked there, and I worked there from like age 14 till graduate from college, and every summer the gypsies would come into Taylor's Falls. They'd have their big bands and, they'd, and I remember one story where they would exchange money. So one guy would come in with a, a, a Two dollar bill, or and he, you know. And then another guy would come in and say, "I give you, I give you a twenty dollar bill," mm. and, and I'd say, "No, you didn't give me a twenty. Well, I got the serial number mm. on it, so I want change on my twenty dollar bill." I said, "No, you gave me a one dollar bill." So the secret was you'd always lay the money on top of the cash register until they left. So if they ever came back and say they switched, <laughs> but the gypsies 
were in town for many, many years. What um, what was that, St Stanley? I mean, is that like the Revival Stanley, Station? Yeah, Stanley yeah. Nelson. Was it a gas station? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and there was competition with the Rebards. So Stanley would say, check out the Rebards, see what the price is. Because well, because my brother. It was Standard my Oil. My brothers worked for Rivards, oh. working for Earl Rivard. Oh, yeah. Don't take any wooden nickels, you can yeah. always say. Yeah. But most of the summer jobs were like, well, the drive-in, I think in the Montaigne started that in 1955, is what I'm thinking, around then. When you were in high school, was the drive-in there? For some reason, 55 sticks in my mind. But um, So if you were really lucky, you got to work at the drive-in, because they always had so much fun. And um, there used to be this place called Wild River Junction. As you're going on 95 into town now, it's where they have the big uh, Minnesota sign. And I think that there's a park uh, building back there now. But when I was in high school, it was called Wild River Junction. And it was owned and run by Sandy Brink, whose family has the Brink's grocery store market. And um, he was very entrepreneurial. And he had a, a small model of a train that ran on tracks up the bluff. People had to go these steps to go up on, to do the train ride. And then there was a long line, like, kind of like an outside strip mall, but there was probably like nine uh, buildings, but they were all connected and they had like garage doors and then there would be like a candy store and uh, he would rent those out to different people, ice cream store. It was for tourists who were at, over at the park camping to come over. And, um, and then the big building was an aquarium. And I'll give this to Sandy. He would go down and fish that St. Croix River. And it was a pretty good sized aquarium. I don't know if it was probably burned. I think he, I don't know, but it was burned down by the time you moved there. But it was a pretty big aquarium, but it was all fish from the St. Croix River. And he had this sturgeon named Oscar in there. This sturgeon was huge. And I never even knew growing up and swimming in the river all the time. I never knew that, that some, a monster like that was down there. But he would have all kinds of fish, you know, and then so people would come in there and they'd go pay money, go through the aquarium. And then it was like um, fast food, you know, that we would serve with ice cream, you know, soft serve cones and stuff like that. And one, two summers, I think, he got like a, a, a summer stock group, a group of, I think they were like college folks, and they had a, they had a <clears throat> acting troupe. And they lived upstairs, and they put on plays, like melodrama plays and stuff like that. So that, that was fun to do, to go to those. Um, but when he wasn't around, when we were closing the night, because he had this big, uh, in the middle of the parking lot was a big, uh, uh, pole with a speaker on top so he would say the train will be leaving in 10 minutes you know so get your tickets for the train whatever but at night when he was gone we would <laughs> start playing with it and we would be hollering <laughs> things over to people in the park people in the park <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> a giant bear, bear something <laughs> zip yourselves in your tents you know get out of the park whatever until the, until the local constabulary came let us know we shouldn't do that anymore. But there was that. And then, um, you know, a lot, I think a lot of kids farmed for their parents in the summertime. There was always farming going on. Yeah, I know um, uh, most of my friends were neighbors who were farm kids. Uh, and I, the girls, I don't know if there was a, like Montaigne's, if they, if they catered to the kids that lived in town, worked there. It was the town kids. And so was, the girls, in the farm area, I, I can remember a girl I went with uh, went up to the Adam Inn, Lindstrom or something. They were waitresses at Lindstrom. The boys who weren't uh, farmers, they would work creamery. The creamery had a lot of workers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the creamery the, there? Uh -huh. The old creamery. Regards creamery. Yeah, they made their own cheese and, uh, and also the, um, the gas station. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Didn't your mother work in a restaurant? Oh, yeah. Tell yeah, us there was a, there was, I forget what it was called, but they would... Uh, Wasn't it the Swedish end? <laughs> no, it was no, the Swedish, what that, was it called? That house so, is still there, down at the end, the, you know, like... Well, it was something that was Swedish smorgasbord? Yeah, it was a Swedish smorgasbord, yeah, yeah. and my mother and along, they had about six women, all Swedish. I remember that picture in one and of they, those they would, Oh, they would, uh, 
they would put on a, a smorgasbord every Sunday. Yeah, it they, was like one day a week. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah people would come. But around. there wasn't, you know, there wasn't much business other than the Rivards businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, so I how about the river? Did you stay away from the river? Did you, no. Was it part of your life? If you were lucky enough to get in with the Rivards, they those guys were so creative. They all they would build these houseboats. We were just talking about this the other day. They would they, they actually made their own houseboats with these uh, on pontoons mm -hmm. that they would weld mm -hmm. together these big fifty gallon drums and stuff like that. And those were the pontoons. And now where the Lions Park is, like the Lions Park North, that was called the Rivard Spot. And I don't know if they own the land or not, but that's what everybody called it. And um, they, you know, they would all gather there. The people that, they, the families that had the houseboats, they would have them down there. And they, you know, once in a blue moon, you know, my parents were friends with them from church. But once in a blue moon, you know, we would get invited to go in the afternoon. We thought that was just the best ever. Um, we, this is what we love to do with the river. You could go to where the dam is. Okay, there weren't all these fences everywhere, like you can't go on the other side of the fence, all this safety stuff we have nowadays, you know. It was just all open. So after church in the summer, we would beg my dad, my mom and my dad, please can we go to the dam, please can we go to the dam. And once in a while we would get to go. So we would drive down the river street and you could just drive right down there to where the dam is and then my mom, she didn't want to have anything to do with it. She couldn't swim. She just, I'm just staying in the car. And then my dad would climb down with us kids to the river, you know, right at the bottom of the dam. So if the water was low, which it, it sure isn't right now, but then there were rocks up and you could walk across those rocks. And I remember my brother Doug falling down, you know, one time my dad reaching down and Pulling them up, you know, and then my yeah. other brothers. Well, did you guys ever go down there and walk across the bottom of the yeah. dam? Hey, hey, no. hey, that was so dangerous. The stuff we did. We used to go to the interstate park and um, jump off the cliffs. Which don't do this, anybody. Don't. <laughs> nobody should do this. This is very, very dangerous. And remember how we told our kids not to jump off high things? And then your daughter got my son to jump off. I think off, it was the other way around. They jumped jump off, off the Osceola Bridge. bridge. <laughs> Both of them. And, <laughs> and we just, you know, but we were we were so <laughs> stupid to jump off those. And, and two of my brothers, they would get the tourists, that highest one there. Um, uh, you know, it's the one where people take a lot of pictures now. They go across that little stone bridge and then they go up there where that big white oak is and and they would get people to give them a quarter and then they would jump off for them you know mm -hmm. and at that time you weren't supposed to jump off on the minnesota side but you could jump off on the wisconsin side so mm -hmm. they would jump off and then if somebody yelled park ranger they just went to the other side <laughs> it was very dangerous Thanks. but but we we something that uh my girlfriends and i did in the summertime um I would beg my mom to let me go, you know, into town. And um, uh, Bob Muller, who had the canoes and the and the the queen, the princess, and everything like that, before uh, the Vatike family bought bought uh, that canoe company, he would rent those canoes to town kids. And I know inflation, but one dollar a day per canoe. So we would bunch of us, we'd get some coolers and we'd put a bunch of stuff in it and we would rent several canoes, it'd be like maybe 10 of us, and we would canoe down to Rock Island, which is off of where Franconia is. Now, I don't know if you can still camp there, but a, a person owned it then. Now it belongs to the parks um, um, in the state or whatever. But So we would camp on there and then the sandbar was right by and we would just go. Yeah, my parents didn't know three days we're out on the river. We're high, you know, we're like 14, 15 years old. Oy, oy. I was a Boy Scout and we always, Dangerous. in the summer, we'd camp on Rock Island mm -hmm. many, many times. And I, most of the my river experience was down the Osceola Bridge down there. And sometimes if you go down Franconia at landing, yeah, but we never do. Where much. like Lawrence Creek comes in? Mm -hmm. That is a cold creek when it comes into the water there, so that's a good place to go on a hot day. 
Um, Deb, you were living on the edge of the world. Sherry can attest to this. When we were at the old school, I'm mean, way up on the hill, probably the only place around where you could experience in the winter time taking a piece of cardboard and sliding down by the Methodist Church all the way downtown yeah. Taylor's Falls, and then you get to the end hoping no cars would be going across. Oh, on the road, yeah. you're doing oh, this. Oh, that was fun. Well, and that was and the, the epitome of. Bus drivers let us take cardboard. And if it wasn't a lot of ice, snow, we made ice. And we'd go over those things, and you'd go down to the depot, and if you're really lucky, you could go all the way down to Main Street and beyond. Exactly. Right to the river, if it was really good. Yeah. Well, what's nice about the snow plow yeah. that road, so you would have a bank. Yeah. That oh, I you can could just go see right it. up on the bank I and then come on down. I can just see it. I love it. And, oh. then, and then behind that was Ash Hill, because <laughs> everything was coal, you know, and the big hill. and. You hope that there was a lot of ice because otherwise you get soot all over yourself. But we went down that sucker. What, what did was, they call what was the last year the train came through? Boy, I think that was like, I think that was, was it into the 50s? I think it the was. Early 50s? Could they have a roundabout or something? Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. That yeah. roundabout is. Is where like the scenic overlook is now, right? Yeah. When, when they go up there, it's at the end of Main Street. Right there. Just before oh. you go up the hill at 95, you yeah. can still see the pillars. Yeah. Didn't, could, turned around. Didn't you take the train to go shopping in the uh, cities? My, my mother would take me, uh, I, we would go, not that's Taylor's Falls, but uh, which is now Pizza Pub, which was the depot in Center City. And we'd go down there and she'd take me every fall uh, to go down on Washington Avenue to get two pair of pants and two shirts. So down in Minneapolis? To Minneapolis, wow. and I'd better not get anything wrong with them. Now, when I got sprayed by the skunk, it sort of changed the things a little bit. But. Yeah, I got kicked out of school twice for three days for... I think it was the skunk that was up on the bike hole. I got uh, skunk, and so one time they wouldn't even let me in the building to call my dad, so they called my dad and told me to come down and pick, pick me up. So I was sitting, uh, it was in the fall, and I was, uh, I was sitting on... Uh, pile of leaves and uh, Mrs. Folson came over and asked me to, to get off her leaves because I was stinking them up. Uh, that really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why did they call that hill Ash Hill? Because it was ashes. From, ashes from and where? cinder from the coal. It was a coal burn. Yeah, oh, the school okay. just coal is all they had. Okay, how yeah. heated the school, huh? Yeah. And that was Rock, it wasn't round. It oh, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Yeah, cool. It's not like charcoal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were hoping that you had it was a was pretty basic uh, uh, cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. Did any famous people come out of your school? There was, there was a famous person? Yeah. I'll, I'll have to give you one. Lowell Nelson. It's a distant relative, and I'm not talking about relative, but Lowell <laughs> graduated in 1920. And his life is amazing, and he's back in town now, and he'll harbor down in Florida over the winter. But Lowell, over the years, got a job with Cargill, and he became one of their top salespeople with commodities. Cargill is still around, a big, big company internationally, and he's dined with the most famous people in the business world and in, in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And he, if you'll ever listen to him, he'll tell you he can remember things back in the 30s and back in the 20s. Tremendous mind. I mean, it's just amazing if you ever had to deal with Lowell Nelson, graduate. But, but he's not alive now. Yes, yes he, he is. Annie Lincoln in his class of 39, and yeah. then my uncle. Oh, I Paul. thought you said he graduated in 20. No, he, from, from high school. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, our foundation honors uh, people every year at the All School Reunion. We honor Joe this time for being the staff person of the, anyway. We've honored a lot of people like Lowell yeah. Nelson, We've honored people. Remember the lady that we honored that you suggested? Wasn't she with the CIA or something? Or? I'm not allowed to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The NSA. Yeah, we've, yeah. Had, National Security. Uh, we've, we've had people, we've had people that have been uh, uh, CEOs yeah. of uh, Lando Lakes, um, 
uh, some of the big big things. Uh, yeah, so we have Deb had a person too. Right, uh, probably the most famous person that I know of, um, and I'm not making comparison into what people accomplish because. Um, I think that a lot of outstanding, successful people have come from Taylor Schultz High School. But there's a fellow named Walt Kern, Walter Kern. He wrote, um, he, his family was from the cities, and they moved up to nearby Franconia, right, about like a me. hobby farm in the, in the 80s. And he actually didn't graduate from Taylor Swall because at the end of his junior year, he scored so highly on his I think, ACTs that they took then that he was offered um, a scholarship at McAllister. And after a year there, he was offered uh, a scholar full scholarship at Princeton. And he became a writer. He's, he's quite well known. He wrote, he, uh, he wrote um, that the the book Up in the Air that George Clooney was in, and they made it into that movie called Up in the Air, mm -hmm. and he's actually in that movie in a in a in, in a in a cameo scene. Um, he <clears throat> has written for the New Yorker for many years. He wrote uh, a book called Thumbsucker, and that was also made into a movie with Vince Vaughn. It's very very interesting movie. And these are all kind of all, not up in the air, but the other his other books are kind of like autobiographical about Taylor Swalls. And then he wrote, I don't know if you'd call um, uh, uh, me, um, med med oh, I can't even say it right now. Not mediocrity, but med meditocracy, where um, you know where people are judged by all these accomplishments. Meritocracy. Meritocracy, thank you. So he wrote that book, and that book is, I, I, I guess he would call it a memoir, but he, he, he writes about when he was at Taylor's Falls and um, some of the teachers that he gives different names. And I think one of the characters that he really <clears throat> speaks highly of, again, was our Mr. Nagasalo, but he gave him a different name. But he did not speak highly of Taylor's Falls. That's the why. I, I, they, uh, they, I know the foundation wants to <laughs> honor him, but well, I, I, didn't like, I didn't like the way that he talked about but he, Taylor's Falls. But he was but he really is, um, you know, and, but then he wrote more about the, this whole thing that allowed him to go to McAllister and then to Princeton and then um, Oxford. Then he got a, 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 it wasn't the Rhodes Scholarship, but it was a, a scholarship like a Rhodes Scholarship um, to go to Oxford. But he is quite, you know, he is pretty famous and he, you know, writes for the New Yorker and he lives well, out in Montana and, and stuff like that. Somebody asked me not too long ago, especially with being on the school board, what we're dealing with special ed. And I said, when I was growing up, even through high school, we never heard of special ed or we never heard of Title I. Our kids, if they did have some difficulty or problem, learning problem, either they quit when they were 16 and some of them became very well to do or at least could take care of, they took over the farm, they worked on the farm, they went on construction. And we've had a couple of people that, you know, had some real <laughs> learning difficulties because of their speech or something. They went on to a good, good job. Uh, one of uh, my classmates, um, he could not play football or sports his senior year because he was 21. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he made it through high school. Uh, the other thing was the war. I needed to say, you know, I already talked about teachers coming back from the war. Um, when I, by the way, there, I think Joe has seen the, uh, the, uh, the floor plan of what the new school was going to be. But they couldn't start the new school till after the war. Because uh, I have something from Clayton Rivard talks about the plan in 1940 and 42. Well, they couldn't start the new school till 50. 50. Uh, another thing was, um, um, I wrote on the cheese box. I showed you a picture of the cheese box. Cheese box was a wooden box put together by Gene Johnson, my bus driver, and his brother, N.O. Johnson, who was the 
uh, shoemaker in Lindstrom, and out in his garage they built that uh, a, um, uh, bus. And uh, it was condemned because if, you, if there had been a fire, you could have never gotten out of it. In order to get out of it, the emergency door was on the side. So you'd have to take out a whole seat in order to, to get out. So, well, you'd be burned up by that time. <laughs> uh, and the chassis, and, and the, they got some old Greyhound um, bus seats uh, that were made out of horsehair. And uh, then the chassis was a 1943, um, yeah, uh, Chevrolet. And uh, the re that was condemned, but again, Gene Johnson could, couldn't get the new bus until 1946, until after the war. Um, and he, he drove the bus, and then uh, he was waiting for that new bus, and I think he drove it one year during Christmas vacation. He got pneumonia over Christmas vacation and died. So his, his son took over, uh, Donald Johnson, but uh, there was a new rule in the district that you couldn't drive bus unless you were a member of the district. And so at that time, then Leland Herbert was the bus driver. I think he took over bus driving at 17. He drove for 40 some years. I don't think he even had a license when he started driving. I know dang well he didn't have a chauffeur's license. <laughs> um, so those are things that really changed because of the war. Sure, sure. Any final comments? You guys just just been fabulous. So. One, just one quick one. Uh, 1973, because uh, I grew up in Chicago. I know that was your year you graduated from Taylor Falls. <laughs> we uh, we moved up, you know, to northern Wisconsin. We originally lived there. I moved to Chicago during my from sixth grade through high school. I lived down there with my parents. They had retired, moved back up. And we had a U-Haul truck, right? So my dad wanted to save 50 bucks. Instead of dropping it off up in Ashland, Wisconsin, he could save 50 bucks if he took it and dropped it off in, in uh, Minneapolis. So I was one elected, you know, uh, fresh out of high school, 17, 18, whatever, to drive it over. My brother lived in Minneapolis. So I drove the U-Haul from Northern Wisconsin, you know, came down, you know, I think it was through Hayward and eventually got to Highway 8 and took Highway 8 to the west. And lo and behold, I stopped at Brevard Station to fill up with gas because those, hmm. you know, new haul trucks just suck gas like anything else. And I, I filled up with gas there. And I don't know, maybe, maybe probably talk to Earl, or could have talked to uh, uh, his his son. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember son's name right now. Well, Doug or uh, Clayton. No, I mean no. Earl's Earl's son. Uh, was it Raymond? Clay, Clay. Raymond, 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 Raymond was probably working there at the time. And it was, and again, dropped off, got rid of my brothers and dropped off the U-Haul and, uh, and then uh, my parents had, you know, come over a few days later or something like that and they spent a few days with my brother and, and his family and came back through and I mentioned to my dad, I said, yeah, we stopped here and, and uh, I said, really kind of a neat little town, neat little town right on the river. And then uh, as we came through, then the next time I was back, there was for the interview. Oh. Well, I always remember Taylor's Falls just because of that stopping there on the way to Minneapolis. Yeah, nice. This shows what kind of a nerd I was. Um, I, Donald Johnson didn't have the personality that Gene did, the bus driver. So I, when I was a junior, senior, um, mm -hmm. we were sitting in the back seat and we loaded the buses to go home and we started singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And, Pretty sore. Uh, Donald said, you know, to be quiet, knock it. Of course, I didn't knock it off, so. Uh, stopped up to now where the roundabout, uh, which was about three and a half miles from where I lived down, in, uh, down on the farm, and he stopped the bus and he told me to get off. And he said, you can walk the rest of your home, and I know you're gonna be home for chores or your, man, your dad'll be mad at you. And he said, by the way, you don't sing very good either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, this